Okay. Sitting there next to the president, it's easier. All right. And that's your business. This chair. The Stetson is a small business, too. Well, I need to hear that today because uh, this morning on Channel 8, I was watching Tip O'Neill when he was telling about all the reverses we put in after the magnificent building of the middle class in America. <laughs> I don't think they're going to buy that. Uh, the recovery, you know, has been so strong in the, uh, in the small, business, small and medium sized segment. Uh, but, uh, I, I don't think that O'Neill can sell that story. The recovery in the, for instance, in income has been about 19% in 1983 when the average wage and salary is only about 5 or 6%. So, you know, the proprietorships and the partnerships are out there doing their job. To give them the freedom to run. Well, I've got two letters on my desk. I know I've got some incidents in my remarks here, but two that just came since that that uh, you love. One of them is uh, a black man in Michigan, which he says some pessimists have referred to as the armpit of America. <laughs> and uh, his business said uh, that he started a small business, but he is now thinking of franchising. And uh, he writes a very wonderful letter. And he says in the letter that his uh, business is cleaning carpets, but without, uh, comes in and cleans them in the floor without, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Shampoo? With okay. some process, it, it isn't with the... Uh, Not with the vacuum? Uh, well, it isn't with the, the big mess and so forth. And his gimmick, just imagine, this is pretty imaginative. His men who do the work do it attired in tuxedos. <laughs> they come to your home with a tuxedo and clean the carpets. <laughs> please, don't you? When we're pleased with Bart, we're in our Yeah, he said this. I said, well, how is it? In New this is a Yale's president, but he said, I said, he said, I, I'm not here. I don't need any money. I don't I think the level of funding for scholarships is is appropriate. And was, it was so what exactly? I have an answer. I'm a little confused. But what exactly is our military thing? No one's talking about the fact that a lot of fellows are getting an education on the basis of serving. Them. Oh yeah, there's a that's a that's a very good idea. program. You know, huh? it's a very good program. Yeah. Well, now, is it? You what mean in the service? service? No, they get they get X amount of dollars. Oh yeah, they, they they get credits for what they uh, for the amount of service they have. They get they have credits for for education and for education expenditures. Good program. Well, yeah, and it's, it's, it's drawing a lot of profit. Let's say a guy is in for three years. What does he get? Anyway? Well, I think I, I, I'll get you a piece of paper on that, Mr. President. I think that they can come out after like five years of service with $20,000 that they can use and apply for yeah. going to school. And yeah, I'm sure it's, it comes. it's a substantial uh, incentive to recruit them. Well, you're <laughs> yeah, Really, still. Yeah. But the reason for Jamal is this is. Uh, so our program this year raises the Pell Grant up for the low income youngsters. Those that really need it. That's what trying, he said. We're trying to move it from there to those that don't need it. So we're really getting a good uh, And he conceded that a hell of a lot of people had been getting stuff that didn't need right. it. Right. Yeah. But you fellows who never had to wash dishes in the curb door before, you don't know what you're doing. Hard to The girls dormitory. Yeah, that was the only kind of dormitory we had. You the most of the fellows were taken care of in the small school and fraternity houses. Yeah. And the, the school is someplace back along the line, and I don't know for what reason before I got there, had canceled out the sorority houses. And I guess maybe in those days the parents wanted a closer school look on it, so they had floors in the dormitory, which was the Delta Zeta floor and the uh, Omega and yeah. so forth. Uh, but the fellows still lived in the in the fraternity houses. Your All right. Well, Hi, Dennis. Hi, everybody. Hi. 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 How are you? Hi, Mr. President. Yes, I'm Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. 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 How are you? Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi. How are you? 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 Hi. How Maybe we can start without it because of the time pressures here. Uh, listen, I, first of all, I just want to say something, and if I haven't said it before to, to some of you, 
I'm distressed by the image that has kind of been created out of the debate and particularly out of the press coverage. That somehow what we're asking is something that on a given day if it's passed, everybody in the school system will find themselves meeting and saying, how are we going to handle this? What are we going to do? I don't see it as that way at all. Because all we're doing is saying, in effect, that the Constitution doesn't prevent you from praying. We are saying, in defense of religious freedom, that no one can plan, no official can dictate a prayer or anything else. And I've, I've tried to explain to many, I have my own picture of what will take place, is that many schools, there won't be any change at all. Now, I am an authority. I went to six elementary schools before I got out of eighth grade, because my old man moved around for better jobs. And uh, trying to remember back into those schools, I don't think in any one of them that we ever had to uh, start the day with a prayer or anything of that kind, but I do know this, that there would be occasions, let's say one of your classmates is home very ill or someone's mother is. And yes, I can remember when all of us would, uh, you pause someplace during the day and, and pray for that. Or there would be occasions when it was uh, during the war, uh, when there might be a prayer or something of that kind. But uh, no formalized prayer, and I'm, I'm sure that today with all the focus on it, there might be some instances where in communities, the teachers, the parents and, and students would decide they wanted it. But what I don't want happening anymore, and one of the reasons for introducing this is the image that is given to young people that there must be something uh, less than good about prayer uh, or it wouldn't be banned in public places. And such things as right over here in Maryland, a group of students, they've had a custom, this group of students got together on their own voluntarily and they bring their lunches to school and they go into an unoccupied classroom during lunch hour, have lunch, and more than prayer, they mainly, they studied the Bible. They had a kind of a Bible study group. And many of them have said that it was very beneficial to them. But all of a sudden, in walked the principal one day, and heavily got gun shy over what all was going on. And he said, you can't do this anymore. Another one of some students out on the school, but recess and so forth, used to uh, sit down together, a little group, and do the same thing, or had prayer. And just looking at them in the windows, they were told they can't do that in the school grounds. And the most, to me, the most shocking is five-year-olds in kindergarten down south. Recently, evidently, they came from families that said grace at meals. And so in the school lunchroom, in lunchtime, some of these little five-year-olds would bow their heads and say what they heard at home, bless this food, and so forth. And a federal judge ruled they can't do it. My idea or picture of their parents, the first time a five-year-old comes home and that night at dinner, the, one of the parents yeah, bows his head to say grace, and the little five-year-old 